Okay, so our next speaker is uh, J, J. Mo Lim. And he will talk about the accurate calculation of position matrix elements for Vanier interpolation. So indeed part one. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. And the work I present is the first part of my collaboration with Minsu Kim and Chalham Park. And I will focus on the translational invariance of position matrix elements. And in the next talk, Minsu will talk about higher order finite difference methods. So the quantity I'll focus today is the position matrix elements, which are the matrix elements of the position operator in the basis of localized one-year functions. So the diagonal part of it is the one-year centers, and the off-diagonal part is the optical matrix elements. And they, they, these matrix elements are used in various places in the one-year function methodology. And the property of those matrix elements that I will discuss is the translational invariance. So let us consider that we translate the whole system, including the electrons and the lattice, by some constant amount A. Then the one-year functions and the centers of the one-year functions will also translate by the same amount. And for the off-diagonal matrix elements, they will not change because of the orthogonality of the one-year functions. So this property should be satisfied for an ideal case and for an accurate calculation of position matrix elements. But the problem is that there are these propulsion matrix elements are usually calculated in an approximate manner. And some approximation preserves this translational invariance and some does not. And what I want to claim today is that approximation that preserves the translational invariance are more accurate and should be used. And for later use, I also note that this overlap matrix element between two block wave functions transformed by this multiplicative phase factor. So let me now explain what kind of approximations are made in practice. So one, usually, one usually uses the reciprocal space of formulation of the position operator. And since one knows these block wave factors only on the set of coarse k-point grids, one needs to use this finite difference expression. And the error of the finite difference expression scales as the square of b, where b is the, the distance between the neighboring k-points. So it is proportional, inversely proportional to the size of the k-point grid. Now the issue here is that one can add some arbitrary terms of order b squared or higher to this right-hand side, and that will still be a valid finite difference formula. So that, the, so that which will also converge to the same exact value in the limit of an infinitely dense grid. But the difference there is the rate of the convergence. In the literature, there are several different formulas proposed. The first one is what I call the naive formula, and it's basically what I explained previously. And there's also the formula by Mazari and Vanderbilt in their original paper. They used the complex logarithm of M instead of M itself. And later, Stengen and Spalding also proposed a slightly different formula where the order of the logarithm and the sum over K points are reversed. In terms of translational invariance, one can easily show that only the latter two formulas are translationally invariant, while the naive one is not. This can be seen from the fact that the multiplicative phase factor in M becomes an additive factor thanks to the complex logarithm. But this does not happen in the case of naive formula. In the Weiner 90 code, only the former two formulas are implemented and the naive formula is the default in postwire90.x, while the Masary Vanderbilt formula is used in wire90.x. And this difference has actually led to some confusion among the users. There are actually two open issues in the wire90 repository on this topic. For example, in the first issue, it is reported that the RMN and AAR data gives very different, very curvature. And the reason behind this turns out to be that those two data are calculated using two different formulas. So it is very highly desirable to settle down this issue and to determine which one of those formulas are more accurate and should be used. To do that, let me first analyze the finite difference error of the various formulas. So first for the naive formula, we can show that the naive formula is equivalent to the expectation value of this exponential operator. From Taylor expansion, one finds that the leading error is the third order moment of the position operator. 
for the Stengel spalding formula, it, it is, the formula is equivalent to the cumulant generating function, which is the logarithm of the expectation value of this exponential operator. And the property of the cumulant generating function tells us that the leading error is the third order central moment. So the difference is that the one year center is subtracted from the position operator. And to compare these two errors, we go to the real space interpretation. And for simplicity, let us consider a 1D system. Then the naive formula can be understood as approximating the position operator with a sine function, as can be seen from this exponential and the sum over B vectors. And the sine function is centered always at the origin of the unit cell. So if the one-year function is also near the origin, then this is a good approximation. But if the one-year function is centered far from the origin of the unit cell, then the approximation breaks down regardless of the localization of the one-year function. In contrast, the stengel spalding formula can be understood again as a sine function, at least up to the leading order in the error. But now the sine function is centered at the center of the one-year function. So th this approximation is a valid one uh, if the one-year function is localized enough, regardless of its center position. Therefore, this analysis shows us that using the translation invariant stengel spalding formula is will be much more accurate and robust than the non-translation invariant naive formula. And so far, I have talked only about the stengel spalding formula. And for the masary van der formula, the result is very similar. The only difference is that we have this additional term that uh, includes the position matrix element between a one-year function and its periodic images. So this additional term does not break the translational invariance, but it does break the size consistency. And by size consist consistency, I mean that a primitive cell calculations with some k-point sampling should give a same result with a corresponding supercell calculation with a gamma point sampling. So, however, but since only the Mazari van der Waals formula is implemented in wire 90, and also because our focus is on the translational invariance, not size consist consistency, I will use the Mazari van der Waals formula in the following and leave the Stengel spalding formula for a future study. So now let me show you some results. To demonstrate the translational invariance or the lack of it in one-year centers, we calculated the one-year centers of monolayer germanium sulfide by shifting the monolayer along the vacuum direction. So here shift 0, 0.0 means that the monolayer is centered at the origin of the unit cell and shift 0, 0.5 means that it is shifted vertically by the half of the unit cell length. So it is as far as possible from the origin. And the results show that the colored dots show that when you, one uses the naive formula, the results are indeed dependent on this shift, while the Mazari van der Waals formula gives translationally invariant results. And what is more important or interesting is that the x-axis, the NKZ, is the k-point sampling along the vacuum direction. So since this is a monolayer calculation, what people usually do is to sample the vacuum direction using only a single k-point. But here you find that if one uses the naive formula, then the error can be extremely large depending on the shift. But when uses, one uses the Mazari van der Waals formula, then the error is very small and the convergence rate is really fast. And this affects not only the matrix elements, but also the physical quantities calculated from it. For example, here we show the optical conductivity of the same material along the D direction. And the gray thick lines are the reference results, which are converged calculations where we used six K points along the vacuum direction. And all the other data, the colored, colored lines are calculated using a single K point, which is what, what usually people do in practice. So first, when one uses the naive formula, we find that the results are independent of the shift for some unknown reason. But the important thing is that they, all, they are both dif very different from the converged result. So using a naive formula can lead to a large error in the spectra. And when one uses the Mazari van der Waals formula, or in other words, if you set this translational invariance flag to true, then the blue line shows that the, if one centers the monolayer at the center origin of the unit cell, then the spectra is very accurate. However, this is not the whole story because if one shifts the monolayer again in the, along the vertical direction, then the spectra changes a lot and the error is significant. 
So even though we use the multi bandwidth formula, the error is significant. And the reason is that multi bandwidth formula fixes only the diagonal part of the one year position matrix element, but the off diagonal parts of the matrix elements are calculated in a non translational invariant manner. So therefore, we find that the translational invariance should be imposed not only on the diagonal part, but also on the off diagonal part. So now we turn to that issue. So in post wire 90.x, what is currently implemented is the following. So being off diagonal means that the one year function indexes i and j are different, or the position, the unit cell index r is different from the zero. So in post wire 90, one uses the some generalization of the Maser van Dibbles formula if i and j are same. But if i and j, the binary function indices, are different, then one uses the naive formula. This had to be done this way because if i and j are different, then the n matrix element converts to zero, not one, as in the former case. So one cannot use the complex logarithm to, to approximate m itself. And here we indeed find that when one calculates the off diagonal matrix elements with three different shifts, the results are dependent on the shift if i and j are different. Therefore, we need to develop a new expression which gives translation invariant results for the full matrix. To do that, we turn back again to the real space interpretation. So for the naive formula, the off diagonal case can be also understood as approximating the position operator with a sine function. And I forgot to mention that the periodicity of this sine function is that of the bone born karma supercell, which is the size of the unit cell times the k-point sample, k size of the k-point grid. And again, what can, what can do to improve accuracy is to shift this sine function close to the Wagner function. Now, since there are two Wagner functions, we place this sine function at the middle of the two centers. And numerically, this becomes multiplying this small phase factor when calculating R. And the computational overhead of this additional step is almost negligible. But that almost negligible computational overhead gives much more accuracy and robustness in the calculation of position matrix elements. Here, we implemented this new method in one Berry code. And here, we indeed find that for the three orthogonal matrix elements I've shown before, using the new translation invariant finite difference formula showed in black symbols, the results are independent of the shift. And more importantly, they converge much faster and are more, much more accurate when using only a single K point along the vacuum direction. And now for the optical conductivity, this is the figure I shown you before that using the Masary van der formula only gives some the translation dependent results and the error can be quite large. And one uses, when one uses our new translation invariant formula, which is fully translation invariant, then the results are really independent of the shift or so it is really translation invariant. And more importantly, the results are very similar to the converged results, even though we used only a single K point along the Z direction. So it is much more accurate and more robust compared to existing methods. Imposing translational invariance is particularly important when the one year functions are far from the origin of the unit cell, as I discussed in the real space interpretation. And so, one example of such a case is the lower low dimensional systems I've discussed, such as the monolayer, where the monolayer or the molecule is placed far from the origin of the unit cell. So, in this case, one might try the, some ad hoc solution of translating the system to lie close to the origin. But this, that kind of ad hoc solution does not always work because there are other cases such as systems with large unit cells where we have nanostructures or defects. And in this case, one cannot translate the system to make all the one-year function lie close to the origin. So there will be always some one-year function that are far from the origin. So, they, so using a translation invariant formula is necessary for this latter cases. So to conclude, we have developed, we have shown numerically and from the real space interpretation that using a translation invariant formula gives much more accurate and robust results compared to the non-translation invariant results. And we have also developed this new expression 
which gives fully translation invariant matrix elements. And this, our, our work is implemented, the code is implemented in the, this branch of the one-year bear repository. And I plan to release it, merge it into the develop branch, official develop branch during this uh, developers meeting. Thank you for the attention. Very, thank you very much for the very nice <coughs> talk. So are there any questions both here in presence and people on Zoom? Yeah, there is one. Thank you for the very clear talk. Um, from the implementation point of view, currently uh, post Vanya 90 uses the naive finite difference uh, formula, right? So there, can we use the idea there just by multiplying the e to the minus i d dot r i of the current uh, iteration and then plus r i of the pre current one and then use that as repeating a few loops to arrive at some converged uh, correct, correct result. So could you explain what you mean by iteration? Um, because the problem there is that the origin is at zero. Yes. Maybe one could, by multiplicating that by some e to the i d dot r of the current I, previous iteration, and then add that one at the end, maybe one can improve. Uh, and if you repeat a few cycles, then without changing the code too much, because uh, that post Vanya 90 is based on uh, the finite difference formula. Maybe can can it we improve the the code that way? Do you think so? First, it, this the what one needs to use, what one needs to implement to implement the translation invariant formula is just simple base factor. So one does not need to change the code a lot. And also, oh, sorry, also, my yeah. comment is about the diagonal part. Uh, for the diagonal part, yes. If, for the diagonal part in post variant ninety, there is an option called translation invariance. So if you set this to true, ah, then you okay, can okay, use okay, the okay. mazari bande formula, which is translation nice, invariance. Nice. Okay. Also, I want to like to note that the Ri and Rj are the one-year centers in this formula, and these one-year centers are calculated in advance using the Masary van Dibbet formula, and they are used as input to calculate the remaining off-diagonal matrix elements. So, so the implementation would be very straightforward. So this is really beautiful work, and uh, so from what you said, it sounds like the optimal thing to do is to use your new formula for the off diagonal part and the stengel spalding formula for the diagonal. Is that uh, your conclusion? Yeah, I have not studied the stengel spalding formula numerically or in ah, detail, uh -huh. so I cannot say much about the marzari van de Vogt versus stengel spalding but I think it's definitely promising because the size consist consistency is of important criteria, so yes. it would be a uh, interesting future direction. And are you planning to, uh, to do that study in um, the near future? I am aware that there are some groups, the group of Anil Damli in, uh, is also trying to go in on this direction. So yeah, I think there are several people working on this. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jamo, for a beautiful, very clear talk. Um, sounds like you might be suggesting that we change the default in Vanier 90 to the translational invariance. Is that right? Yeah, this is right. So, so actually, this is more a comment for other people. Uh, this workshop is a really good opportunity. If you have suggestions for changes to default parameters, please make a case when you when you give a talk. Uh, we'll keep a, we'll keep a note of them, and uh, you know the next release will be a good opportunity to change some some default parameters that need to be changed. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think the translation invariant formula should be the default algorithm instead of the non-translation invariant ones in binary 90. Any other questions? Okay, Stefan, just wait a second. 
Uh, just regarding what is the default uh, uh, event understanding post W90, it's translation of variant it cannot be used when you have additional matrix elements like for the orbital magnetization and so on. Well, but maybe not many people use them. And actually, sorry, my, my question is, uh, can this procedure be somehow generalized to these matrix elements, you know, which have more than one R or maybe I missed it. Yeah, this is one of our future okay. words. Ah, yeah. yeah, okay, sorry. I haven't studied yet, but definitely I will study. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Very nice talk. So this R minus R to the third, that yeah. comes from the logarithm naturally, right? Um, In the logarithm, there is no R minus R. That kind of just magically out comes when you uh, expand the logarithm, right? Right. So is there um, then similar formula for the octagonal? Like you kind of take the logarithm of the matrix or something? Yeah, so that does not work to my knowledge because here before the diagonal case, M converts to one. M is very similar to one. No, no, but, so but, can, but yeah. not logarithm of matrix element. Is there, is there a way to write this formula that it would work for entire matrix? You know, naively, you know, like take a logarithm of entire matrix, which is Let's different see. than each matrix element or something like that. Then, yeah, and yeah. then you would this R minus R would, R, yeah, R minus R center would come out naturally out of the formula. I see, I haven't thought about that, but this seems very interesting and promising. Yeah. I'll, I'll think of right. it. I think I have a comment on this. I was trying to find it, but I couldn't find it. But Pierino Silvestrelli in the late 90s, uh, wrote out with Michele Parinello a, a series of formulas that were all equivalent to the logarithm of uh, M and you know one minus M square and so on. I've forgotten what they are, but it could be good exactly in this spirit uh, to try if there is something that then can be a unified uh, sort of translational invariant. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the comment. Other questions? Anyone on Zoom? Okay, no. Okay, so if not, I think we can thank again Jembo. Hmm. So there's <clears throat> there is a a small change in the schedule. There, now we're supposed to have a talk by Jul Julien Ibanez Atspiros about the implementation of nonlinear optical responses. But actually, unfortunately, he wrote to us that he cannot deliver his talk. So we stop here a little bit earlier. Yes, please. Ah, right, right. Sorry, sorry. For, for, anyhow, okay, that's fine. Yeah, in my mind, it was supposed to be here in presence. That's why. Okay. So this is going to be the last talk of this morning then. Minsu, you can share your screen. Yes. yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. <clears throat> um, I have cold symptoms, as you can hear my voice. So I am presenting online in year three yesterday. Oh. Oh, oh, this talk is part two, part of the final difference, <clears throat> continued from the previous part by Jemo, uh, translational invariants. So, uh, my, my surname is GHIM, but it's the same as KIM. But I decided to choose my surname as GHIM because KIM is too frequent. Anyway, let's start. So, we are going to compute this position matrix element uh, calculated by this equation. So V is the volume of the unit cell, and U and K is the <coughs> app initial flow wave function obtained from the coarse grade calculation. Uh, uh, due to the numerical reason, we should calculate this K integral with the final number of K points 
using discrete JSON, and we also calculate the gradients using the uh, first to the finite differ difference, which is an approximation. Here, uh, B is uh, neighboring vectors from K to K plus B, and double B is the corresponding weight or coefficient for the finite difference. So these position matrix elements are required for binary spread and very, very curvature like term to calculate conductivity, orbital magnetization, shift current, and so on. So it is important to make position converge fast. So <clears throat> why it is important to consider higher the finite difference formula is that uh, the error of position matrix elements arising from maximally localized binary function is known as exponentially decreasing with nk uh, on the nk by nk by nk initial, initial course grid. But the error arising from the first order of finite difference is in order of nk to the minus 2. Also, Marjorie and Vanderbilt mentioned in their PLB paper, it would be interesting to explore whether use of a higher or the finite difference representation of gradient k might improve this convergence, especially the Vanier spread of the invariant part of the Vanier spread. So let's start from one dimension. Uh, we are assuming that we are using a central symmetric formula for finite difference. So for example, the first order formula is given as here. So we have two neighbors, minus h and plus h with the error proportional to h squared. The second order has four neighbors with the error proportional to h to the four. So in this manner, we can extend to the n nth order and find the coefficients and error dependence. Now let's move on to the general case. The last term in the finite difference formula is added it is fk to match the convention with that of previously published papers such as uh, Marjorie Vanderbilt in 1997. But this term plays no role because we have assumed the central symmetric assumption. And uh, since wb equals w minus b, so we don't need to keep this in mind. Uh, the weight the WB are determined from neighbors by the completeness relation, the condition for the first of the case, given by this equation, symmetric in Cartesian indices alpha and beta. So now we have to find the analogy for the nth order case. Uh, <clears throat> the general formula can be compared with the one dimensional case for the first order example, uh, the formula for the finite difference can be reconstructed as this form. So uh, one over two B square is the weight and B is H or minus H. So B is the neighboring vector. So this WB and B also satisfy the completeness relation. <coughs> For the higher order finite difference, the second order formula in one dimension can also be reconstructed similarly. So we, uh, in three dimension, we have to choose more B vectors and corresponding complete these relations and WB. So the question can be divided into the two parts. Question one, how to find B for higher order cases? Question two, how to find WB from the higher order version of the completeness relation? So it's the first question. Uh, we have chose uh, neighbors as B to B, 3B in one dimension, but the situation is different because we have freedom to choose B in 2D or 3D because we can consider more directions other than one directions. So we can come up with 
two options. Uh, the first strategy is as near as possible, or in other words, near research. Uh, using the first strategy, we search from the origin to the farther region with increasing distance from K. So we'll find the nearest B vectors. And the next strategy is a simple extension. Uh, we find, uh, we first find the first order finite difference B vectors and multiply it by two, three, or N. So we are going to use B, two B, three B, or N B with modified weight. Then, after the determination of B vectors, next we have to find the corresponding weights. For the first order, we just had to make only the first derivative correct, but now we have new terms such as second derivative, the third order derivative, uh, or the second order. So we have to eliminate these terms. Using more terms in the Taylor expansion, we can extract the first derivative. The first derivative is written as the B vector summation. And if we inserted this Taylor expansion into the FK plus B, we have many terms and we can compare the left hand side and the right hand side term by term. Okay, so, so the first term in the right hand side is nearly f. So the sum of wb b alpha should be zero. And the next term is the gradient of f. So uh, to make, make this term gradient alpha of f, the sum of wb b alpha b beta should be the Kronecker delta of alpha beta. And next, the, the third order is the, the the terms with three Bs or four Bs should be zero. <clears throat> now we have uh, four equation in total for the second order, but the first and the third equations are automatically satisfied because we have assumed we, uh, we have assumed Bs are central symmetrically distributed and the number of Bs are, in this case, all numbers. So they are automatically satisfied. So let's look at the first order equation. Uh, actually, the number of the first order equation is six because it is the combination with repetition of two partition indices. <clears throat> so for example, it is uh, constructed by xx, xy, yy, yz, zz, and zx. So we can get maximally six independent wb. Uh, but for example, uh, in, in these cubic cases, uh, we have only one w, wb with uh, six points for the simple cubic cases, eight, point, uh, eight b vectors for the pcc cases, and 12 points for the FCC case, but uh, uh, with more <clears throat> uh, non-symmetrical non cases, uh, we require maximally six independent WB, like triclinic cases. So for the second order equation, uh, we have now a combination with repetition of four Cartesian indices, which is 15. So we have total 21 equations. In this manner, the nth order, the number of the, the first order to the nth order equations are proportional, is proportional to the n cube. So when it comes to the error, error of gradient and minor spread is proportional to p to the 2n. So <clears throat> let me compare the two methods, near research versus simple extension. Um, the first method, near research, works by including additional p from the origin and check the conditions repeatedly until the conditions are satisfied. 
the good point is that the uh, since the nearest search uses the dearest p vectors and because the error is proportional to p to 2n this results in the smaller error relative to the simple extension uh, while the bad thing is that the large <coughs> it has a large number of equations For the simple extension, the weights WB can be readily found as introduced in the next page. So the, uh, to find WB is very simple. And also <clears throat> the number of B is relatively small. So also the dot MMN5, such as dot MMN5 from PW to Vanier 90 dot X from quantum espresso becomes very small. So this is about finding WB uh, with the simple method. At first, assume the completeness relation with the readily found first order B vectors and WB. And the high order versions of completeness relations are expanded. And using the first order equation, the final equation is simplified by this matrix equation. Uh, therefore, the weights of simple can be found by the Kramer's rule. Uh, the Kramer's rule is quite expensive to be calculated, but the coefficient matrix is similar to the so-called Vanderbilt matrix, which is easy to find determinant. So the determinant of this matrix is able to be calculated by hand. So just the answer order weights are simply found by this formula. So we are ready to calculate one year quantities. The first example is polarization, one year polarization of potassium niobate, whose structure is an elongated perovskite. Here the white spheres are oxygens, the great gray sphere in the middle is a niobium, and the black dust at the corner is potassium. So polarization has two contributions. The first contribution is the ionic contribution, and the second contribution is the electronic contribution, uh, which can be calculated by the sum of the vanier centers in occupied states. Here, the factor two is inserted because uh, we have done uh, non-spin non polarized calculation. So we expect the error dependence follows this, this formula. And in the left figure, figure D, we can see the convergence of polarization with increasing number of k-points. Uh, here, simple and nearest search are not much different because here dot and cross mark are <coughs> uh, not not much different here so, and the third order is not much faster than the second order relative to the first order the convergence of the first first order and the converge value is found near 0 0.38 which is the same of the result of Stengel and Spalding. So in the right figure, uh, the x-axis x -axis has been changed to this, proportional to nk to minus 2n2, to, to see the error depends more clearly. So the y-intercept at x equals 0 is the expected converged value. Uh, the next example is the conversion of binary so spread of silicon. The same analysis can be applied because the error behavior of binary spread is the same as uh, the error dependence of the binary polarization. <coughs> so uh, here, the inset in the right figure shows the B dependence of the error is also correct for the second order and the third order. 
the main bottleneck is the uh, non-self-consistent calculation. So the reducing NK is the most important matter. Uh, and the time consumption becomes not quite long using the, the higher order calculation. So the higher order calculation is beneficial when we consider total computational time because of <coughs> we can reduce the number of key points. Also, the strength and Spalding's work can be interpreted to the infinite order finite difference, but only with the second order, we can obtain a quite good convergence without much time consumption. But <clears throat> we have to be cautious because uh, the higher order finite difference can be helpful for convergence, but it may not work without translational invariant formulas introduced by Jemo. This is an illustration of translational mirrors. The pink line, this sign function, is the position operator, and the blue line is the position operator with translational invariance. So the role of higher order finite difference is to make the position to the real position with more Taylor expansion terms. So the position is now a, like a salt shape. However, without translational invariant, higher order finite difference with may not work because uh, the wrong location of may uh, the wrong location of saltus may cause some error. So uh, especially when banner functions are far from the origin, uh, I recommend to use the higher order finite difference with translational invariant formulas at the same time, especially when uh, your functions are far from the origin. So <clears throat> the conclusion is that the, the error, we verified the error or the, or the order of error is proportional to b to the 2n and the higher order finite difference requires more completeness relations. Oh, we had two methods, near search and simple extension, but for the polarization or bar near spread, uh, they showed no significant difference. And also just a simple second of the finite difference can enhance calcula calculations much. <clears throat> one, one more thing is without translation invariance, a higher order correction may be insufficient. So uh, translation invariance uh, should be the, the default for Banyo 19 or as, uh, and so on. So we have only calculated uh, binary spread or binary polarization or other quantities such as orbital magnetization, which has two gradients of two gradients of ab initio flow states or spin current, which has gradient with spin. Not only this term, uh, these quantities should be calculated to test the higher order finite difference further. So this is the end of the talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Minsum, <clears throat> uh, for the great talk. Uh, is there any question here? In the meantime, if online you have a question, please write them in, in the chat. Thanks very much for a very clear talk. And so um, I hope you feel better soon. Uh, just a quick question. So when you go to higher order, then obviously you have to calculate more matrix elements, uh, the M, M, N, K, B. And so there's sort of a trade-off between calculating more of those matrix elements and just using the first order and using more K points. Can you comment on sort of the, the relative computational cost and, and where you see that? Oh, that's a good question. Um... Uh, in the process of uh, binaryization, we should calculate first uh, self-consistent and, and next non-self-consistent and next PW2 binary 90 with uh, new neighboring vectors from the NNKP5s and 
finally linearization. Okay, so the nk point, the number of nk points uh, affects the NSCF or NSCF and p to Banyar 90 because linearization speed is now not not quite not quite boosted. So uh, so for the NSCF calculation, it's very important to reduce NK because it is NK, but we, we <coughs> the, the number of K points is proportional to NK2 because on the NK by NK by NK additional course grid. So computational time of NSCF is proportional to NK2. <coughs> And uh, oh, if we if we assume that we use the simple method, the na neighbor the neighboring vectors the na the number of neighboring vectors is proportional to n because we are using b two b three b or n b. Uh, uh, I also recommend to use the simple method rather than the nearest nearest search method. Uh, so the computational time of P to Banyar 90 may be the, the proportional to uh, O and K. So uh, <clears throat> the total computational time will be reduced with higher order because the main bottling may be the NSCF calculation. Hi. Um, if I could just ask a point of clarification. Um, when you're doing the your higher order finite difference, um, am I right to think that you're doing that for the construction of the Banyer functions themselves? Because I can imagine a, a situation in which um, you apply it as a post correction. So you could use the the, the, the the straight foot, the, the, simple, the first order formula that we have at the moment in order to get to, to, to do the minimization of the spread functional. And then um, you could uh, use the higher order formula afterwards in order to get a more accurate representation of the, of the, of the spread. My point being that the, the value functions themselves, I think, converge quite quickly with respect to the k-point grid. It's just simply the representation of the spread that is, that is slower. Um, so I just wanted to comment on that. <clears throat> oh, so, so could you repeat that again, please? So your higher order formula for computing the finite, for, um, for computing the spread is that what is used for the minimization of the Vanier functions? Or are you applying this in a post minimization step to, to correct the spread and the centers? I'm sorry, can you hear the question that's being asked? From I, the I, I, I'm thinking. But... <laughs> uh, sorry, um, I'm afraid I can, I can make a good explanation. But, um, could, could you email later? <laughs> I can follow up with you for sure. Okay, so um, so actually Minsu, uh, if I understand correctly, used uh, the correct formula in both 
uh, vinylization and in calculating the matrix. Number. And we haven't yet uh, separated the two effects, but we, we are, he's uh, going to uh, study the separate effects. Yeah, separately. Yeah, I guess it's really interesting. Yeah. So yeah, it is a very important question, right? Yes, I guess I'm worried with the higher order formula, whether there's anything more complicated in the, in the minimization process, but perhaps it doesn't actually lead, and, and, and your inability to test this, you can prove perhaps that the Vanier function <coughs> are fairly invariant to how we choose that spread. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, indeed, also as, as a follow-on <laughs> comment, uh, I mean, uh, what you choose uh, to calculate the gradients affects the symmetry that you end up, uh, you know, with the Vanier function. And so it might be easier with a first order formula to choose the right uh, group of symmetrized B vectors so that you have a desired symmetry. Because, you know, sometimes uh, you can afford uh, a lower accuracy find a difference formulas, but with the right symmetry properties for the gradient and the real space vector that comes from it, then a more accurate formula that though breaks the symmetry. So sometimes it's easier to work with a, you know, first order finite differences, and then maybe just doing higher order as a post-processing. Uh, at the same time, the symmetry, <coughs> the, the number of neighbors are, uh, quite large, large, large. So it will be good to use both of them at the same time. Yeah. Uh, let me adjust. Uh, yeah. Thank, thanks, Minsu. And also, thanks for the nice comment. Actually, we also found that if we use just four sort of formula, the symmetry is broken. So we need very many fine coarse grid points. So we want to also, we, we are planning to look into this, how it affects this metric. Yeah, thanks for the comment. Hi, do you think that uh, using this high order formula might improve also the symmetries when using the automated uh, procedure? Because all it's all the, also there, we found that the automated procedure sometimes generates funny functions that do not respect the symmetries at their center. Um, I'm not sure the symmetries, uh, the symmetry is largely related to the higher order finite difference, but <laughs> uh, maybe I think I can test it more extensively. So this, this is a question. I just, uh, another, another quick question. I mean, so you've been looking at um, finite difference formulae that sort of work along, along lines in, in, in reciprocal space, but actually there's also more complicated ones called like Mechtelen discretizations, which take account of, uh, of, of more than just, you know, one direction, they're, they're, they're multi-directional finite difference formulae. So, you know, the, 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 the value at a particular point depends on, points around in, uh, in 3D in a more complicated way. And there's a lot of literature actually in the engineering um, uh, field on you know, accuracy of finite difference formulations and looking at some of these more complicated ones. It, it would actually just be interesting to know which, which is the best for, for this problem, um, even, um, even accounting for these ones. Is that similar to the near search or a near, near search? Uses uh, not not one not or Cartesian Cartesian direction. As, uh, this method uses many directions other than uh, <coughs> special directions. Um, 
I think I, I think uh, they may be different. So uh, is it possible to just avoid doing the finite difference and directly solve uh, for the derivative of the box state? I mean, I think DFPT must compute that at some point. Uh, so maybe like, is there a way to like pull out of ph.x this derivative directly and work somehow with that? <coughs> so direct, what, what do you mean by direct? So, you know, NSCF solves, you know, U of K, but you can write the equation for derivative of U of K with respect to K, and then, you know, compute that and store somehow. Yeah, so um, yeah, in the center on the right, this matrix element, you know, direct, direct, directly compute derivative of U. Is that possible somehow? Oh, but if you compute it in the block gauge, you then transform back somehow, I don't know. And the other comment is, I think on slide four, like you, you had this uh, higher order um, expressions, but I think they are, they give you smaller errors only if the function you're integrating is very smooth. I think if the function is not smooth, then the higher order, I think actually gives you worse result. but I might not remember this right. Uh, generally, when you your comment. Uh, the final difference would uh, work if the function is like analytic, not that, uh, not having a singular points. Yeah, but then is Perfect. it possible the band structure sometimes have some things which are not smooth or I, I don't know, maybe, maybe that doesn't make sense. Um, maybe it's always smooth, I don't know. I was just thinking. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, maybe I'm uh, just ignorant, but uh, when I calculate the uh, position matrix, uh, uh, I calculated uh, some, uh, uh, how to say, uh, several compounds, but uh, some of them, uh, when they have the band crossing, there is some uh, numerical errors in position matrix. Is, is there something like this uh, when you calculate uh, related to the band crossing? Because uh, I, I don't know, just uh, I'm maybe ignorant, but uh, it seems there is some problem in my calculation. Do you, do you aware of that such kind of a uh, problem? Yes. Mm. Oh, sorry, I'm not aware, not aware of that. Ah, okay. <coughs> okay. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe my calculation was not good. Uh, I, um, yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, if not, we can <coughs> thank Minsu again. And now for, for real this time, <laughs> this, was, this was the last talk of um, this morning. So now we have a lunch break and we come back here at uh, 2 p.m. Okay, for the... So for the flash talks, we have a one hour flash talks. And then there is a small change in the schedule. As I told you, keep an eye on, uh, on the website. So tomorrow morning, we will not have uh, the talk of uh, Ivano Tevernelli on quantum computing and applications in natural science. The talk is being moved to Thursday, same time, 9 a.m. So if there is anyone who is supposed to give a talk at any other time and wants to anticipate that, just come to me. And uh, otherwise we will start off an hour later. Thank you.